coming. Good uh, to all of you being here. Today's presentation, uh, today's presentation is going to be on the uh, before we get started. We're going to have an answer So who would like to do that? Anybody? Yes, yes, thank you. All right, so uh, this is ACM, it's a society here on campus. The ways that we communicate is uh, to get emails from the secretary. I go through this every week because communication is important. If you don't pay attention, then you're going to miss stuff. So um, posters, emails from us, uh, we have a registration form. If you're interested in like, getting more up-to-date news, go there. And then there's a Slack chat room that the whole department uses. Uh, the CSEE department, that anybody can join, honestly. That will let you get in. Uh, I'll show this later. So uh, we are going to have community reports. It's the same format. Committee reports, they just do a quick little uh, update on what's been going on in their committee, and then we'll have a presentation. So we'll get started with that. Get the speaker officer. John. Burton, what's the topic? Um, um, artificial intelligence? No. No? no? What is it? No. All right, I'll come back to you. Okay. okay. Uh, projects. Uh, projects. I don't think Doug is here today. No, he didn't come today. He didn't come today? Doug is our vice chair. He's not in today, but he's in charge of projects. Um, and so there's some movement in that department. But since he's not here today, we'll uh, cross over that. And if you're interested, you can uh, send an email or a message to any of us through Slack. Online committee. There's been some pretty interesting developments in that area. So we have bots. A website. It's it's right now we're in the process of making you know, a WordPress site. Mm -hmm. Some people have access to what's going on with the, uh, the association. Uh, about eight weeks, we're working on building our own site. About a month. So that's my decision. That's real coding and real work, and uh, web is definitely a booming field in the technology industry. So you want to have a real project that gets used, but uh, have a lot of fun people to work with in the process, then you better join right in on the online committee because they're doing that stuff. Their, their mission is to support online students. And uh, that's, that's part of what they're doing. They do the, what, the online broadcast, and they also do uh, the website. So a lot of cool stuff there. So then we have the Artificial Intelligence Committee. And is Michael in? I think I'm going to talk to some people. But uh, artificial intelligence community, they're planning to change their meeting place, or meeting time, because there is a lot of uh, conflict that was going on. And so uh, that's, I know off the top of my head, I could probably check later. So Vera could probably update us in a few minutes. And, um, yeah, we're going to meet on Tuesday from the site for so they're planning to meet on Tuesdays at 5.30 in Austin. All right. Um, and they're doing really cool stuff. Code Challenge today is paid men. I'm really going to talk to some people. we got to be here, man. All right. Code Challenge committee, they have an ongoing code, ongoing code challenge for um, uh, palindromes. So 
they're working on, he's also working on getting it set so that way, that way his co challenges will be posted to the website, our website, that we've got courtesy of the ECM organization. So uh, that's ongoing. And that's it for reports. Uh, and news, we, I found out that there, that there is going to be a, uh, a lunch with a guy from the uh, University of Idaho, I think. He's going to be doing a topic on cybersecurity. It's going to sit, this little lunch meeting is going to be in Idaho Falls. There is a poster with details of it over by the EP Lab. It's a regular letter document, and uh, all the details are on there. It's about cybersecurity, and Idaho Falls is really well known for that. I mean, not Idaho Falls, but Idaho. Yeah. Other Burton and machine learning next week. Um, great. And also Google I.O. Google's developer conference is on the 18th. So if you guys are interested in watching that, heads up. It's coming. Uh, they're sure to announce some interesting new developments uh, in that area. All right. So now moving on to our presentation on Python by Rhoda Grimmett. We would like to take the stage of logged into the podium so that way our online audience can see. Yeah? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I forgot about Rocket Club. I wanted to uh, pitch. Okay, thank you. Um, Peyton, uh, you could join us. Tell us about what's going on. So, the co challenge I'm on the challenge I'm going to talk to you guys about the website. I'm going to move it to the ladies. Um, so, on the co challenge I'm going to talk to you guys about the website. I'm I think it's .com. Is it .com? No, it's .com. It's .org? Okay. Here you go. Those that I know. Okay. 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 For this is our new website. And it's awesome because it's like a full package server. All right. So um, back to you, Brother Grimmett. <laughs> Uh, I'll show some things, so we need to Yes, that's the same on this that way it's Yeah, so I'm Mm -hmm. 
All right, what would you like to know about Python? Why? <laughs> Why? Because we can. We can. So I was playing on an artificial intelligence lecture to machines who learn. Well, I guess I'm wrong. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so this teaching thing is going to be a lot easier when we're teaching machines. And then I'll just pay me to think big thought. So, what's the most popular language program? Java. Uh, Java. 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 Wow. So this, this is a measure of that. So it's not, I wouldn't say that this is the end all be all to life, but this is a measure of you know, what's going on from a program. And I don't know all the specific definitions there, but this is a, you know, a uh, kind of a measure of popularity, and plus a change. So it's kind of fascinating. Uh, Java is at the top, and then game. You can get this. And the, what's that? Okay. All right. Probably a lot of web development as well. Yeah. C and C++ is still very close to the top. A little bit further down than half inches past. A little bit. C sharp. C sharp. A little bit. It's becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, PHP, JavaScript. Ruby's kind of moving up a little bit. All right. So does everybody here know how to program in Java? Do we teach Java programming? Yeah. Do we? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. We teach C. That's good. Do we teach C? Yes. Okay. Do we teach PHP? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we teach JavaScript? How about Ruby? No. No Ruby. How about Python? Yes. No. Okay, so we uh, we began teaching Python in the fall. We teach the CS101 class, which is a beginning program class in Python. Did you ever take that class? Oh, you shouldn't. But <laughs> one of the reasons I said it, it's designed for non majors so it's designed to allow people to come and explore a little bit of programming without putting them right into CS 124. Um, and so we, we created that class. Why do you think we chose Python? It's it's pretty easy to learn. So this is a little bit of a conjecture on my part, but I think it's the easiest. One. And we're finding more and more universities are teaching it as their first language that they introduced to. What I just was reading yesterday at the University of Washington was called 5,000 computer They just built a $100 million building a few years ago and they were building another second one. Yeah, how, just how computer science do. So why is Python easy to learn? How many how many deaths of Python? Anybody's done Python? Very little. Why do you think it's easy? Is the syntax easier than C? Yeah. <laughs> French. French? French? French. See. What do you think it's easier? Okay. Okay, good. Well, wow. those of you who use Python. <clears throat> What's that? Ah, so we don't have to 
Ah, so we don't have to decide up front what the impact we need to use. Is that good or bad? Makes it easier. It depends. Good. All right. So I use Python a lot. So I, I build robots. So I use Python a lot. And I find it significantly easier than C. And I find it significantly easier than C for two reasons. First of all, I don't need a make. And I know most of you love make <laughs> They're your absolute favorite. But I just don't like it. And figuring out what's connected to what and putting all that stuff in there and then missing a library and having not compiled. And that is painful. The other thing I like about it is it's very easy to import, um, very easy to import um, functionality. So Brother Burton and I were having this conversation. Does anybody remember the first program in CS124 that you wrote, the first project? No, the first project. <laughs> what was the second project? The calendar, right? So how many lines were in your program calendar? Or your, your calendar program, I'm sorry. How many? A few too long ago to remember. <laughs> so Brother Burton sent me a program that was two lines. Import a library and then display the calendar. Now, now I realize that it's not you know, it's a fair comparison. The importing capability and expanding your capability with libraries is really, really good. Um, so what else can we talk about? Um, um, so it is an interpretive language. What does an interpretive language mean? It's free. That's good. It doesn't cost anything, but it's interpretive. What does that mean? So what happens is it takes each line of code, it figures out what it does for that line of code, and then does it. Then it takes the next line of code and figures out what that line of code is going to do and then does it. That's different than C. C is a compiled language. What happens in the C code world? It figures it all out before we ever run it. So you take the whole program, we run it through the translator, it creates all of the machine code, and then we run that machine code. So we know before we ever start what our program looks like. Now, there are some exceptions to that. The compiled language normally holds that kind of territory. Whereas a, an interpreter language is going to take each line of code, turn it into machine code, do it, and then turn the next one. So we're working a little bit of Python? All right, let's do it. Let's see what we've got. How about there's no Python here? Let's download it. Where do we get Python from? I've got it already here. So this is Python. What's that? What I choose this version? Um, that's a good question. Um, when I teach my Python, Python CS 101 on class, I use this one. I think it's closer to a Code Academy. I think my students in my CS 101 class just do the Code Academy Python course. That's what they do to learn the language. So they're 13 units. They go through one unit each week. They really get a nice uh, web user interface to learn the language. And uh, Sound 2.7 is a little closer to uh, it's the closest to what's going on from Code Academy. Right. All right. So this, so this is, does this look like C? No. So this is the command prompt. I can do some things like this. So I can enter in a line of command at that prompt, and we will do it. Or I could do something like this. So again, that reinforces the kind of interpretive nature of Python. You can type in a command and watch it happen. That is kind of nice, by the way, if I don't know what I'm like if not doing exactly or I'm not sure of syntax. Right, really quickly. 
That would be kind of uncomfortable if every time we wanted to run a program, we just typed it line by line. Probably not a good idea, right? So what we can do is do the file open, file new, and this is just a text file. And over here we can type in our book. And we could say three plus three. And this is print, hello, world. And if I do run, it is going to ask me to save the file. Let's save it as uh, one. So it saves it as a text file, and Python runs us. And that means it goes through each one. Did our code work? Mm -hmm. Oh, girl, did. What happened to the other thing? I didn't tell it to print. That better? Is this easier than C? So far? <laughs> certainly, certainly printing out hello world is a little easier, isn't it? How many lines did I need to see? Do they need to know about functions? In C? Do I need, I need to do include? Should I do that here? So we can see why, in many cases, uh, people find it easier. Because I don't have to think about, think about a lot of those things that I have to use it in C. What's that? No, I can have other files open. What might be more interesting, though, is how do I get um, functionality? So let's say I wanted to do a square root. How would I do that? What's that? I would get a library. How do I do that? I say import. And now I have a math library. So I think this is the function that I remember, right? I can do something like this. Print math values. I'm just part of the way it actually. Can you know? Can you know? What's going on? Yeah, let's just go to 25. Let's go to 25. Good. Good. Turn it up. So all I have to do is go out and find the kind of libraries I need. Yeah, it's a little trickier than that. There's a set of libraries that kind of come as a standard install of Python. There are other libraries that don't. So if I want those libraries, what I'd have to do is download those libraries. And if I put them in this directory structure, it will act like it knows where that code is. And all I have to do is import and get all, all of the functions that are in that file. Questions on that? Questions on that? Seem easier? Easier than C? Very. Very. Yeah, but not nearly as fun, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk about a couple of other things. I'm just going to show you that I, that I use. Um, let's, let's. Here, here, like this. Um, um, just go to Python. Just go to Python. So one of the cool libraries out of library is a library called Python 3. And it is a game infrastructure for Python. And it's what I would call a very light game infrastructure, which means it's not doesn't have a lot of code associated with it. And it's uh, it's not very complicated. But what it will allow you to do is design and build your own games for you. So here's a basic little game that you can set up and use and do. Now, you guys, no one here likes to write games, right? No one here is a game people. 
right. I'd like to show you this. It's kind of cool. Um, let's go this down. So uh, for my 101 class, they're supposed to do a project at the end that they can choose. And this is an example of a project I allow them to do. So this is a website called Program Arcade Games. And it will walk you through step by step, by, uh, step by step creating your very own game. Some people like yeah. that. Some people like that. Let's do. No, let's not do that. Of the character playing the game, and then we'll appear like a wizard. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but there's a set of people that just don't want to spend their time to figure out that. So Python is like Java, like a lot of languages, that provide us with a, um, a much easier approach to solving the same problems with a different paradigm. And we find, especially non-programmers like that. So there are two areas where Python has become really, really prevalent. First is in um, scientific computing. So, so there's a So Spider is an IDE. Does everyone know what IDE is? <coughs> Spider is an IDE that provides a whole bunch of libraries for scientific process. So if I'm a chemist or a physicist, uh, I like libraries like NumPy, which is a linear algebra library that's going to do all kinds of really cool things with matrices. Uh, SciPy, which lets me do all kinds of things with uh, like FFTs and signal processing. And that plotlide provides a whole bunch of uh, 3D and 2D quantum libraries. So once I've got them, yeah, it's really straightforward. So creating a, an interactive display of a chemistry experiment might take a week in C, and it might take you know, three hours. Again, utilizing the libraries. Yes. Just on that topic, I, I was listening to a podcast that was talking about Python, and what I heard is that some libraries will actually make it so it compiles. I don't know if compiles is the right word, but it implements the, the code in C so that you get performance. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I was going to talk about that. Um, one of the reasons that we like C is because of its compiled nature, and that just provides a speed opportunity. Python cannot be compiled. And the reason is, is a little bit simple. Uh, when we want to declare a variable type in C, what do we do? Is there a CS124 student in the room? If we want a variable in C, what do we do? And the variable type. So in C, we always know the type. We know our storage. In Python, we don't. We just say we want to start using variable x or variable y. And then the system has to figure out the type of that variable. And we do that at runtime. Right? So when we're actually running the program is when we set aside the memory. And so it's, it's impossible to compile Python because we wouldn't have enough information to compile it. Um, now, what happens often is if it's not fast enough, we'll create libraries in C. And then we'll we'll uh, call them just like we would Python libraries. And there's a Cython is a C to Python transfer process, so that I can take a C library and create headers that will look like uh, Python libraries. So again, if I'm really concerned about the performance of certain algorithms, I can code them in C, uh, use this interface, and then they look like Python libraries to me. Which is kind of cool. So again, a lot of the folks. Uh, in fact, we had we actually had some people over in the chemistry department teaching a Python class as a special topics class here at BYU Idaho because it's become so popular. So in again chemistry, physics, geology, all the sciences, Python has become extremely popular in recent years. And primarily because it's very easy to do some basic things. So instead of becoming a, a, a computer science expert, I can use my knowledge to get it done. Kind of cool. Um, what else? Yes? You said you use it to do robotic stuff. I do. What kind of examples do you robotic? Good. I was going to bring one. I, it's, they're sitting in my office. So those of you who know me know I have robots. So right now I'm building Johnny 5. Who knows who Johnny 5 is? Raise show of hands. Short circuit. Yes. See, it's a sad day. No. How many of you know War Games? You've seen the movie War Games. Yeah, a few of you. Brother Burton and I were laughing about the voice on War Games the other day too. All right. Well, Johnny Five was a robot that came out. That movie came out in 1987. 
and he was a robot that could roll around on tracks and had arms and and so I'm building him right now for a for a book project. This is a connect that's connected to him. So he has a connect for his head. And then this is the depth image and then this is the video image. So what we'll be able to do is do things like edge detection so he can go down the hall without running into the wall. Uh, and um, we can also do some really cool things like uh, motion detection and facial recognition. And I don't have them installed in him, uh, or I would show you, but those come with Python examples. It takes me about 50 lines of code to do motion detection. So with about 50 lines of Python code, I can sense the movement in a frame and draw a circle around the center of that movement. And again, mostly it's because of the libraries that come with that. Uh, we'll show you a couple of other things here. Uh, so this is all on a Raspberry Pi, by the way, which is just a uh, it's just a um, Linux machine, really. So a small, inexpensive Linux machine. It's got decent capability. Their latest version has actually quite good capability. Um, and then I SSH into my Linux machine. I make my robot a wireless access point, then I connect my laptop to my robot, and then I have complete control through SSH and <coughs> VNC viewer everything that I, he can see. That's why we see this on my on my PC. But I can show you a couple of things here. Let's see. Yeah. So one of the things I have to do is make my robot roll. My robot has two tracks, two DC motors. I bought a, a motor control board that can control those two DC motors. And here's my code to make that work. Uh, let's do this. <laughs> so here's my code to make that happen. <laughs> So I import a time library that just lets me do things like time sleep, which is a, a second delay. And then this is my robot control. I instantiate my robot. This makes him go forward. This makes him stop. And then I uh, let's do this. This is a little different. Um, it's a little more complex. So this is a library. Um, I can type a, I can type an F and he'll go forward, a V will go backwards, and S he'll stop. This is a turn left. This is a turn right. And so it's just in the loop. So I can, I can send him down the. I can send him from my office connected wirelessly down the hall, seeing what he sees through the connect camera, and then controlling him with the, with the keypad. Um, and he doesn't speak yet, but my R2-T2s do. So we, we can send them down the hall. We, we do this in the middle school and talk to the kids. And I think it's kind of cool that there's this R2-D2 with no, no wires connected to it running down the hall and then it starts talking to them. So we think that's really cool. And the beauty of it, again, is in Python, it's this many lines of code. So if I were to do this in C, it would be substantially longer. All right. Okay. So like, with the Raspberry Pi, what would be an introductory project? That would uh, that's a great question. I... Um, I would start with a little. They make these little cars. Yes. You had us do. We're working on getting the RC car. Yeah. So, um, some of you know this. I, I have books that I've written that kind of show you how to do these projects, and my students use them. Um, I'd probably start with um, something like this. Uh, 
let's start with this little car. So you get that for $12. It has two DC motors. Then you can put a Raspberry Pi on the top of that. Uh, then you can put a webcam on the Raspberry Pi. And if you put a speaker and a microphone, you could do speech recognition and speech. Um, at one point, we were doing, we we're going to do laser tag cars like this, but the IEEE guys kind of petered out on us. But it's fairly easy to add a little laser sensor and a little laser, you know, laser target or uh, you know, laser, and you can play laser tag with them. That's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um, yes? Do they still have those? I remember hearing someone talk about putting those in there. Yeah, we've got them around, and uh, people play with them all the time. I uh, I also take the little Wowie robots and, and make them speech recognition, so the kids think that's kind of fun to walk up and talk to the robot, and it does a high five and things like that. So. The R2D2s really are popular, and they're really inexpensive. What I do there is I take this, and I go here, and I say R2D2 bubble machine. <laughs> so I buy this for $57. I take all the stuff out of this, and then I put the, I put the wheels here, and then put, again, a, a capability of voice control and sound. And, I, I've got a little projector I'm going to put in there at some point so I can say, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. <laughs> but it won't be holographic, so a little disappointing. <laughs> um, th there are a couple of other things, and these are not my spaces, but I want to make you aware of them. Uh, so a couple of things that are happening, by the way, in the program. This fall, we're going to start teaching CS241 as a Python class. That's the, that's the uh, object-oriented and data structure class that the double E's take. But Brother um, Burton in the future will be teaching his 450 class, which is machine learning, will be in Python because that's a big uh, space that people use Python. That's for machine learning. And he'll talk about that here in a couple of times, but he can talk to you about that. And that's a huge space that Python is becoming more and more popular in. And it's becoming more popular as a web, a web development tool. Uh, and there are frameworks where you can develop in Python uh, web pages. Um, I'm not as familiar with that space because that's not my space, but that's So what kind of interesting projects have you seen students do with Python? Oh, like I say, mostly it's robotic stuff. Yeah. So we do all kinds of, so you should all come to the Research and Creative Works Conference because we'll be displaying some projects there. What have you got going for projects there, I think? Um, you're building an R2-D2, right? Yeah. We've got, uh, got a couple other projects like that, mostly robotics. Uh, we had the uh, uh, intelligent arm last time where they would draw on a, on a sketch pad and it would draw it out on a piece of paper. Uh, that's kind of cool. So, um, so again, pretty much anything in the robotic space right now is Python. When is that conference? It is the Thursday before finals week. So it's like uh, July 14th. Now, is anybody here working on projects on their own? I want to make you aware of a couple of things. We are putting together, there is a, uh, there's a conference in Boise. July, I think it's 27th and 28th. Yes, July 27th and 28th, and we're thinking of taking a van over to this conference. So it's an undergraduate research conference where you'll be able to present your projects if you like, to look it on your resume, to have presented at a you know conference that's not here at, at BYU Idaho. I'm almost certain there will be employers there from Boise wandering around looking for gifted students. So, um, so I'll. If you're interested in that, let me know, and we'll be talking more about that. It might be something that will happen more often. The people in Boise are very excited about having us um, become or come to Boise more often because there's a lot of company there who need engineers and computer scientists, and we don't place a lot of students in that area, and there's companies there who want to change that. So great great opportunity to meet local employers in the Boise area mm -hmm. if that's something you're, you're interested in. Yes. Oh, 
Yes. So I'm aware that you are very well networked, and that you come across there with come up with various requests for the university to do something. Yes. And do you have any like uh, open requests that uh, some of the students here might be interested in that might have an uh, application with Python or even in other languages? Oh, there's all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, oh, yeah, there is one project that we're doing for, for my ECN 361 class. Does everybody know where Bear World is? Have you ever heard of Bear World? Mm -hmm. They have bears. They're just down the street down here. <laughs> they have lots of bears. I went through there the other day, like 50 bears. Uh, we're going to put a remote video camera in their de uh, birthing den. So that's not something they've ever had or been able to see the actual process of you know, what happens in the birthing den. So we're going to put a remote camera in there for them so that they can see that. Um, um, we've got two projects going on with the uh, Museum of Idaho. We have a, uh, I don't know if anybody's seen our interactive sandbox. Anybody played with the interactive sandbox? It's a sandbox that as you make mountains, they change color. They look like mountains. So as they get taller, they get they go from green to brown to white for the snow. And the low level areas are blue. And it actually looks like water's flowing. So students who are learning about geology can actually see a topographical map right in the sandbox. And so we built that for them, and we're updating that. And then we're doing a rock, paper, scissors hand for them. So um, young people will be able, able to walk up and, and play rock, paper, scissors with a robotic hand. So we'll be doing that and getting that in there. I'm also very excited about maybe doing something with the zoo in Idaho Falls. I suspect if we went down and talked to them, they'd be very excited about you know some things that we could do with them, and maybe remote feeding the tigers so we don't have to put anybody at risk. <laughs> okay, they are chewed off or something like that. All right. Other questions? So again, I use Python a lot. It is kind of becoming the de facto standard in the embedded world, which is very different than before because C and C++ were kind of the standard. But as it becomes more powerful and easier to use, we're actually seeing embedded developers, that is, we're actually seeing uh, embedded processor developers developing processors for the Python language. So there will actually be processors that you buy specifically designed to run Python. Yes. Python's been around for a long time, right? So this is mostly just because of processing power. Because you can yeah. yeah. In the past, there's been a perfor enough performance difference between C and Python that sometimes we said we couldn't use it. Right. But now as, as things become faster and more powerful, it becomes less of an issue. Uh, memory size also is becoming significant. All right. Other questions? Yes. So using Python and other applications, uh, what would, what would aside from robotics, what other reasons would people want to use it? And so again, in, in uh, scientific computing, I don't care about the beauty of my code. I just need to see my data in signal processing. So chemists, physicists, Astronomers love Python because it's very easy to take their data and turn it into something they can value, as opposed to having to go to their IT people to give them a C code something or a biology. So what can't you do with Python? What can't you do with Python? Um, I think if you if you are going to do Unity game development, I don't think Python is the is pretty much C and C plus plus. And for very small embedded controllers, C and C++ is still there. And Java is still the language of the web. But it's changing a little bit. Python is a little more powerful, little more powerful than Java. And I think it's easier to learn, but that's me. I, I'm not a huge Java fan. Other people are, but I'm not. Okay. When you say languages, Powerful. What are you referring to? Uh, what can I? What can, problems can I solve with it? Yeah. So, um, Java. Sometimes I get to a point where I'm, I want to do something and I can't really do that. The, you know, it's not as opposed to C and C plus plus, where I can normally find somebody who's already done it. I don't like to write my own code. I like to have somebody else write it for me if I can. Because I don't code for coding beauty. I code to get something done. So I'm looking as, as much as I can at you know, getting that from there. That's right. <laughs> That's right. All right. Hey, one last thing, completely unrelated. I just want to check on everybody because I just came from a meeting. 
Are, is everybody aware of the financial aid changes that are happening in the fall? Has that been talked through with everybody? Okay. So there, so there are substantial changes with how um, financial aid is going to work in the fall. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview, but please, please, please go find out more about it. Um, you, you will need 14 credits if you want to receive a scholarship. And the other big change is the U.S. government will not pay for any class that's not in your program unless it's over your 12 credits. So if you need, if you're going to teach, if you say, hey, I'm going to take four classes this fall, uh, three of them computer science and one interpretive dance, when you go to get your FAFSA check, it'll only be three quarters of a full check if you're if you qualify for a full benefit because the government will say we're not going to pay for the interpretive dance class because it's not in your program. Now if you do the four computer science classes that are in program then you could take the interpretive dance class and they will pay for it because it, you, your, your 12 credits gets you full-time student status. So think about that as you plan your as you plan your classes, um, because I, I have no control over that. We at the university have no control over that. So we can't override that in any way. Um, it, is a, it is a U.S. government process. And that's not simple for it, but it's for... It is for all universities, but not all universities have been able to implement it yet because of the tracking that's required. We are introducing new software that allows us to track that. We believe soon the government will start finding universities that don't track that, which is so we're not trying to go that way. We're trying to avoid a fine by going that way. If you can take a minor with your major, then yes. So if you're a software engineering student, because you have 25 electives, They'll pay for those 25 electives, whatever you want to choose. Whether you want to do a minor or, you know, geology or whatever that is. So again, I don't know all the answers, but please check with the financial aid folks and be clear. What will happen is they look at your classes that you are uh, enrolled in on the very first day of class, and that decides what check you get. So it's hard to fix it later. If you if you haven't followed the right rules, so please be careful with that. We want to avoid any any challenges. And again, I I can't override that in any way. So if you come to me and say I've got to drop out of school, I'll probably go to jail, prison maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so again, check it check it now before you get there, please. Thank you, All right. If you want to see my robots, there's a bunch of them in my office. Um, and uh, again, look for the Research and Creative Works Conference. It's a great opportunity to see what's going on. Even if you're not in the class and you want to present at the Research and Creative Works Conference, it's a really good experience. And again, if you're interested in doing a project for the uh, Boise State i stuff, just let me know, and we'll include you in that process. All right, that's it. Thank you, Brother Grant. Um, so it's going to change on me. Projector loves to do this. It squishes the picture. Um, we are going to be starting up soon a thing called CodeSpace, which is a place where any of you can work on personal projects, like or learn how to do a new language, like Python. Um, and we'll have students here from various levels of experience to offer that up. Um, this is, again, how we communicate, and that way you can guys can get uh, uh, in the loop if you aren't in it already. Next week, our presentation will be by Brother Burton, and he'll be doing machine learning, which is, uh, I guess, is an aspect of artificial intelligence, because machines being able to learn and stuff like that. So that would be very, very interesting. I'd love to see you guys come to that event. We'll have posters for that. And also, we are going to have our leadership meeting. It's going to be in the Bidup building where? Silver, where's the leadership meeting? Uh, 151. 151 
at 5.15. So if you are interested in participating or listening or giving feed, what? 6.15. Oh, gosh. 6.15 Yes, 6.15. That's my call. Um, and you can attend. Now, uh, I'd love to see some, some more activity uh, in the website stuff. There's a lot of movement going on in there. It's like an ongoing project. There's real momentum. And uh, the design is just up for grabs. We're figuring out how we're going to look. We're designing a logo. We're figuring out you know, how we're going to make things uh, be awesome. And so if I can, let me see. I'm trying to make a logo for our society. And it's just a work in progress right now. I can select the group and then set the transparency to maybe overlay. This is kind of what we're looking at right now. But uh, we're trying to figure out what we're going to look like and define our identity. That will be known across campus, and it will be on our posters and stuff like that and set it up for ACM in the future. And if any of you have any questions, you can ask or you can go. But thank you for all for coming. Look forward to seeing you next week. It's sure to be really, really fun. And thank you for the cameraman. You guys are great. Thank you for your help, honestly. Mm -hmm. We're good.